So why are cities where they are? Or if you're sassy, what principles explain the spatial distribution of urban areas throughout the world? And as it turns out, there are four answers to that question that you need to know, namely the rank size rule, the primate city rule, the gravity model, and Chris Dollar's central place theory. So I reckon we ought to talk about it, and if you're ready to get them brain cows milked, let's get to it. Now before we get all cozy with these four potential explanations, let me remind you of two concepts that I talked about in previous videos. And point your ear holes this way, because these two things are really important to understanding the spatial distribution of the cities on our fair planet. The first concept is urban hierarchy, which refers to the ranking of various cities, the most powerful and influential of which holding the highest places and the least powerful and influential holding the lowest places. Or as the kids say, some cities are S tier and others are F tier. And if that doesn't convince you of my hipness, well then, <laughs> you should see my orthopedic shoes. Anyway, the second concept you need to remember is a city's situation, which refers to its interconnection with other urban areas. So cities in any given place are not islands unto themselves, but instead have a series of linkages between each other that creates relationships among them. So that means different cities play different roles within the hierarchy. Some are cultural centers, others are the seat of political power and government, and others are economic centers or whatever. And therefore, those cities can't all be smashed together in one geographic location. Instead, they must be geographically distributed in a way that allows all of them to work together. Okay, now that's just a surface level explanation as to why cities are where they are. But now let's go a little deeper and explore these four explanations for the spatial distribution of cities. But before I do, let me just mention that if you need help getting an A in your class and a five on your exam and make, you might want to check out my AP Human Geography Heimler Review Guide. It's the fastest way to study and it's got whole unit review videos that you won't find here on YouTube. It's got no guides to follow along, practice questions, practice exams, and answer keys for all of it. And if that's something you're into, you can find the link in the description below. Okay, so the first theoretical framework for understanding why cities are hierarchically arranged is the rank size rule, which explains the distribution of a country's cities based on proportional population. So according to the rank size rule, the largest city by population is the baseline and then all other cities are ranked accordingly. Which is to say this is just a numbers game. So let's say a country has five cities and city A is the biggest. The rank size rule predicts that city B should have half the population of city A. And then city C should have a third of the population, city D a fourth, city E a fifth of the population of the grand urban poopa on top of the list. Okay, now before I give you an example, I should tell you that this method of predicting the size of cities really only works in developed countries with a long history of urbanization. And then it only like kind of works. Regardless, the United States is a pretty good example of the rank size rule. So the largest city is New York City with a population of about 8.6 million. So if this rule holds, we should expect the next largest city to be about half as populous. And look at that, Los Angeles is the second largest city with about 4 million people. And then Chicago has a population of 2.6 million, which wouldn't you know it is about a third as populous as New York City. But here's where I tell you that after Chicago, the rule starts breaking down because next here comes Houston, Texas, and their population is almost the same as Chicago. So maybe it's less of a rank size rule and more of a rank size suggestion. And big emphasis on suggestion because like I said, this rule only kind of works in developed countries among whom Germany's cities probably follow the rank size rule the closest. But in developing countries, the spatial distribution of their cities doesn't even come close to rank size guidelines. So now let me tell you about another rule. Yes, it's the primate city rule, which explains urban hierarchy in a country whose biggest city is disproportionately large, which is known as a primate. Primate city. And I know some of you are disappointed because you thought I was going to tell you about a city full of apes, but alas, no. But anyway, the key idea in this rule is that in places where primate cities exist, there will be very few other large or medium-sized cities. And this is often the case in developing countries in the periphery and semi-periphery. For example, Mexico City has a population that would make New York City poop its pants, which is to say about 20 million people. So the rank size rule would say that the next largest city should be about 10 million, but no. Instead, the second largest Mexican city is Guadalajara, which has a population of slightly over 5 million, which is a fifth of Mexico City. Now, here's where I tell you that the primate rule can also apply to developed countries. For example, London and Paris can be classified as primate cities as well. But in general, the primate city rule most often applies to urban patterns in developing countries. And almost universally, if a developing country conforms to the primate city rule, it's because they were former colonies of other world powers who concentrated political and economic interactions into that city. And one important thing to remember here is that the rank size rule and the primate city rule are mortal enemies. In other words, a country's cities will either conform to the rank size or primate city schematic 
systematic and not both. Okay, now let me introduce you to the gravity model. And this theory of urban spatial arrangement is a little different. So the gravity model explains the patterns of interaction between two places, claiming that the larger and closer the two cities are, the more connected they will be. And then the smaller and further apart the two cities are, the less connected they will be. And this model is primarily used to predict the flow of people between two cities, either for work or vacation or migration, etc. So the key to understanding this model is this. Interactions between two cities are proportional to both proximity and size. And that's just a fancier way of saying what I just said 10 seconds ago. The closer and bigger two cities are, the more interaction they're going to have with one another and vice versa. So in terms of proximity, think about New York City and New Jersey here. Now they're relatively close to one another and connected by a prodigious amount of infrastructure like roads and bridges and trains. And so as the cost of housing continues to climb in New York City, many people choose to live in New Jersey and commute for work to New York. And in light of that, city governments in New Jersey might use the gravity model to plan future housing developments as more New Yorkers are being priced out of housing. But the size of the two cities also impacts their interconnectedness. So now think of New York City and Los Angeles. So if the gravity model only considered proximity as a criterion for interaction, then those two cities would have precisely no relationship since they're on opposite sides of the whole dang continent. But since both cities are large in terms of population and several of their respective functions, like entertainment for example, these two cities have a strong connection because of their places on the U.S. urban hierarchy. Okay, and now I hope you're ready for the granddaddy of all spatial theories because now it's time to sit a spell with Chris Dollar's central place theory, which explains the size and spatial arrangement of cities, towns, and other settlements in an area. Now, it's important to start with a definition of a central place. Now, basically, this describes a settlement whose purpose is to provide goods and services to the people living in the surrounding settlements. And if you've been paying attention, then you'll recognize this central place as a city. And Chris Dollar laid out his theoretical framework like this in a series of hexagons. And I know this looks confusing, but stick with me and I'll explain it up real nice. So here's the central place right here in the middle. And then radiating out from there, you have a hierarchy of smaller settlements like towns and villages and hamlets, which depend on the central place for various goods and services. And the reason all these entities are arranged like this is based on consumer behavior about the goods and services that they want to purchase. For example, let's just say that there's only one Chick-fil-A in this theoretical settlement and it's right here in the central place. And when you're deciding where to live, you have to ask yourself, how far am I willing to travel in order to get that tasty goodness? If you're in a regular habit of crushing a chicken sandwich, then maybe you need to settle close to the central place. But you might settle further away if you look at that sandwich and you can take it or leave it, to which I say, you monster. So that example hints at two controlling principles in Chris Dollar's theory. First, threshold, which describes the number of people needed to support a good or service. I mean, have you ever wondered why sports stadiums or entertainment arenas are built in cities and not way out in the country? It's because the threshold for those kinds of venues is very high, and so they need to be in proximity to the greatest number of people. And then the second related concept is range, which refers to the distance people are willing to travel to spend money on a good or service. So you might be willing to travel a decent distance to go see a concert in a big stadium, but if you live 25 miles from the nearest Chick-fil-A, then it's going to cost you more in gas than the actual sandwich. <laughs> Worth it! Anyway, that means that by Chris Dollar's reckoning, low-order goods and services, which include common items like groceries or clothing, have a low range and threshold. These are low-cost items for which it doesn't make a lot of sense to travel a great distance to obtain. On the other hand, high-order goods and services, which include specialty or luxury items like airports or sports arenas or highly specialized neurosurgeons, have a high range and threshold. In other words, people are willing to travel farther in order to purchase these things because they're so specialized that you just can't get them anywhere. Okay, so pulling it all together, according to central place theory, smaller settlements offer a range of low order goods and services since people are less willing to travel to obtain them. And then large cities specialize in high order goods because they have the minimum threshold to support those goods and services and because of their uniqueness people are willing to travel to obtain them. And that's why this hierarchy of settlements and their accompanying spatial arrangement looks like this. But you're going to need to remember that just like any other model this one also has limitations when applying it to the real world. For example, Christoller's theory makes similar assumptions about spatial arrangement that we saw in Von Tunen's model, namely flatland with no physical barriers or political boundaries. Also, Christoller assumes that settlements are arranged this way primarily as a result of people's economic decisions, like how far they are willing to travel for goods and services. But that doesn't take into account the fact that cities can serve other functions besides economics, functions like administration or nodes of government, like, say, Washington, D.C. In those cases, the patterns of settlement have very little to do with economics and more to do with other functions necessary to the city's thriving. But really, the biggest limitation of Christoller's theory is the development of transportation technology that messes this model 
bottles crap up entirely. Like because today cars are almost universal in many places, people can travel farther and faster to do the things that they want or to buy the things that they want. Or to put an even finer point on it, with the rise of the internet, you don't even have to leave your couch to purchase consumer goods or to watch sports on TV. So I guess Chris Dollar can just go cry in a bag of broken dreams. Okay, click here to keep reviewing for Unit 6 and click here to grab my AP Human Geography Heimler Review Guide, which has everything you need to get an A in your class and a 5 on your exam in May. Thanks for coming around and I'll catch you on the flip-flop. Heimler out.